Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Anthony Peak Consciousness Hour. Um, what is important here, I don't have Sarah with us today. She might be joining us later. But one of the things I want to make sure is that as far as we know, we are streaming generally to everybody rather than just streaming to my friends. So if you are aware of that, if you can let us know um, what we're going out at, um, please let me know. But um, let's keep our fingers crossed about that. Right, today's guest is a really good friend of mine, Maggie Latorell. Maggie and I met probably about five or six years ago. And again, with many of my friends, but particularly with Maggie, we have so much in common. We can chat about things for so long. And one of the things that um, we both have a great mutual interest in is the effect of Alzheimer's disease on individuals, as we both lost our respective mothers to this terrible illness. But what Maggie has done is something far more interesting. Maggie has written what I consider to be probably one of the best books on the subject I've ever, I've ever read, if not one of the best books I've ever read full stop. And it's this book here, um, The Gift of Alzheimer's. Now, I know that in the past, when Maggie and I last did a, an interview on Consciousness Hour, a couple of people said, well, you know, there's, Alzheimer's is not a gift. How can you possibly call it a gift? when it's misunderstanding exactly what is taking place when somebody comes down with Alzheimer's and when somebody starts to um, experience Alzheimer's. And it's, a, it's an opportunity as well as a tragedy when we lose our friends to this terrible illness because it makes people aware of other things. It opens up their mind to a broader reality and a reality that is both extraordinary and life enhancing. And I'm hoping in the next hour and a half, two hours, that when Maggie and I start swapping anecdotes about our respective mothers, you will find some amazing things that we both have experienced over that period of time. Um, so Maggie, welcome to the Anthony Peake Consciousness Hour. Thanks, <coughs> Anthony, Tony. Um, <laughs> first of all, I, I want to thank you for inviting me because I just love talking about this and it's great to have the opportunity. So thank you. It is because it was wonderful because you, myself and um, Penny Satori did an event a few years yeah. ago in London. And I think the three of us, the, 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 the kind of the, the Zen that we created, though, was quite incredible. It was an overlap of knowledge and experiences, which was quite wonderful. And again, if anybody's interested, uh, uh, Penny has been a previous guest on this show as well. And if you want to check what her angle on near death experiences as well that would be really interesting but one of the things that I've always been interested in Maggie although we've met many many times and we've chatted over coffee and had some wonderful discussions I don't know a great deal about your background um, but to just tell us a little bit first about what you're doing these days now because I know you're living in a, a wonderful environment so you can tell us about this and then just tell us a little about who is Maggie Latterell so firstly what are you up to now right well, right now I'm living in the Fintorn community, which is in the northeast of Scotland. I'm Scottish, as it happens. It's actually an international community, um, an intentional community. It's been in existence for nearly 60 years, um, and it's an eco village. I live in a lovely eco house and in a really beautiful environment. So, um, and have an extremely interesting life here. So, that's um, kind of what I'm up to now. Um, just a bit about this, quite a challenge. <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> um, I was born in um, Ayrshire in Scotland. I grew up in provincial Scotland and it was very provincial in those days. Um, very difficult um, environment that I grew up in. My mother at the time w w had one nervous breakdown after another, but today she'd have been diagnosed of having bipolar disorder. So she was either in a total crisis, threatening suicide and sobbing and throwing things around, or she was totally joyful and loving and playing the piano and singing and dancing. How old, how old are you when all this started? Actually, when I was born. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was a wartime baby and her first child. And, you know, it wasn't easy for people who were even in, you know, stable mental health, but she had postnatal depression. Again, nobody knew about that then. Mm. But in retrospect, it's, it's clear. 
that she had. But you know, she was also a very independent spirit. If she'd been in London, she had at the time she'd have been a suffragette. <laughs> she, she was an Isadora Duncan type. Really? And very, very repressed by the social mores of the time, which was one of the things that caused her massive explosion, emotional explosions. Um, so I grew up, um, I, I grew up in a dysfunctional home, but I made the best of my life outside. I loved sports and uh, it seemed that my career was going to be in art and design. I'd always thought that. Uh, but then when I left school, uh, my father said, you can be a teacher, a nurse or a secretary. <laughs> really? Well, again, it was about security. He'd been oh. through the war. Yes. You know, at the time, I wasn't as, as uh, forgiving as I am now. Anyway, um, I, I managed to get a really to, good job in London. So I escaped to London uh, at the age of 19 and had a, a very interesting career. However, so what year, what year did you come down to London then? It must have been a fascinating time 62. culturally. I was in London in the 60s. Wow. <laughs> sharing flats and <laughs> I won't go into anything else. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it was a very exciting time to be in London. And um, during, in my early twenties, I was introduced to uh, an organization called the Study Society that had been set up to study the work of Ospensky, who I'd never heard of. Wow. But you know, we're talking now about the time when the Beatles were into meditation mm. and the study society um, had teachings coming from the Shankrashari of Northern India every week. And we were all attending these groups because it was uh, the oral tradition, nothing was written down, studying this work. Um, I was introduced to meditation that was mandatory. So suddenly having come from provincial Scotland, mm. <laughs> <laughs> the Presbyterian Church, <laughs> mm. exposed to um, just things that turned my life upside down and everything I thought about, everything I thought I knew, it just went out of the window. So was the was it was it overtly Ospensky in its in its approach, or was it more eclectic than that? Because Ospensky, I'm a great fan of Ospensky. I always right. have been. No, oh, hugely, right. yeah, hugely, yeah. hugely. Yeah. Well, I'd say at the time when I joined, it was really the dominant teaching was coming from, it was all about the teaching from the Shankrasharya. Mm. Uh, and it was fascinating. I mean, I just loved it. So that was the beginning of my spiritual journey. And I say that now because that experience um, uh, was the start of my spiritual journey. And, you know, I just continued to be really interested in every aspect of spirituality, consciousness, you know, whatever. And I was in London, you know, for 50 years before I moved here. Uh, so when my parents were failing, I, I had that whole, I was carrying that whole history of my own spiritual journey to the situation with them. Mm. And um, I'm not, I should also say that my time, you know, when I was in London, Having had such a traumatic childhood, I did have a huge crisis when I, I, life was incredibly difficult for years. I could hardly leave the house for panic attacks and things. And I say that because, you know, I don't want people to think that everything was hunky-dory all the way. Mm. It really wasn't. Um, but I got through that and I got married and had a child and um, trained as a teacher and did an apprenticeship as a potter, set up my pottery. Um, uh, then I worked in community education for many years, and uh, that was a very interesting experience because it was a new a new area. That we were a pilot project. And whereabouts um, in London were you at the time? I was in Belsize Park, so that's mm. Hampstead. So mm. Hampstead, and um, I I got interested in energy, and I sorry trained as an energy therapist and kinesiologist and counselor psychotherapist and set myself up as a as a therapist and also a trainer I trained for 30 years I ran training courses for healthcare professionals mainly 
and because um, that's interesting in itself so that healthcare professionals were, were interested in the spiritual side of things as well not so much what i set up was a really professional course for kinesiologists can you explain what kinesiology is for the guys yes, out there that don't know, know about it muscle testing <laughs> it's, right. it's using the body to um to monitor the body's stresses or not to any stimulus. And then I, I wrote the, the classic introductory book on kinesiology called Principles of Kinesiology, and that was published by HarperCollins in, in 1992, mm. and it's still published. Wow. <laughs> so that was the beginning of my writing uh, career. And um, around the year 2000, my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and I, my father, was really going downhill and my sister was an alcoholic and going downhill and one day when I was walking along the beach carefree I suddenly had this realization that within the next 10 years I was going to lose the three people who were closest to me in my life and that was a kind of shocking shock. was that was that just an intellectual realization or was it something deeper than no, that? It, it was you know, I just put the information together. I think mm. I think I've been so busy in London, commuting up, going backwards and forwards. I hadn't really, I hadn't stopped to think about it. But you know what it's like walking along the beach. You go into a kind of altered state. Mm. I go into a sort of altered state, and um, I thought, oh, I need to. How am I going to deal with this? And I decided that I really wanted to support my parents at the end of their lives. Um, and I think that was, uh, that sounds very altruistic, but I don't think it was, because I think there was so much healing that needed to happen following the, all the traumas of my childhood. So I, I think in a way, at, maybe at a more subconscious level, I, I was drawn back into the family um, as, a, as a way of exploring how we could be together differently. And um, I supported my, my parents um, in, at the end of their lives for a period of, of 10 years. I was commuting back and forwards to Scotland and helping latterly, I spent most of my time in Scotland. And although it's not in the book, my father had some similar experiences to my mother near the end of his life. It was just more condensed which suggested to me that if you can be with somebody in a particular way and be really open to what they're, um, what they're experiencing and what they're telling you, uh, um, I, I came up with a little catch phrase, which was my L-E-V-L-P, which is listen, really listen, engage with them in their world and validate them, even if it's not true to you, true to them and you can say it sounds like you know you da, 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 da. Mm. and um and i did that with both of them and i i think it it helped to it helped keep things moving along mm. so there um there there i was with two elderly parents and um actually my sister died in 1999 from an alcohol related illness and she was younger than you, I guess. Oh, yeah. Look, yes, she was three mm. years younger than me. Mm. Um, so that was me with my parents. And my mother had went through all the normal stages initially, you know, the horrendous at home, just horrendous. My father, who was impatient, just really couldn't cope with it. And eventually I booked her in for respite care to a, a care home, which happened to be next door to our home. And the matron said, she can't possibly go back home. And a part of me was sort of thing, I told you so. I've been trying to tell everybody this. And then another part was thinking, help, I've 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 put her in there. She'll never be out, she'll never be home again. So it was um it was quite difficult. But actually, the staff didn't know her history and um they loved her. Really? And because she was loved, she loved them, and she was very happy. And um, as she got more frail, you know, I, I began to feel compassion for her in a way I hadn't ever done before. 
And she started to pick up on my thoughts and feelings. As, as I can remember, it was quite poignant. I was thinking, poor mum, you know, for someone who had been a dancer and a gym teacher, and there she was in a wheelchair, this is terrible. And I was feeling compassion. And she said, you love me. Wow. And, um, you know, I can still feel that now. It's a very poignant moment. I and presume I presume that wouldn't be something she would have spontaneously said either, no. which made it more powerful. Yeah. But it was an indication to me that she was tuning into me. Mm. And that was the beginning of the tuning in, which continued for another three years. And at what point then did you think that this this is extraordinary and I need to really make a record of this because if I don't, it's going to be lost to posterity? What made you decide that you were going to well, do that? Well, one day um, she said, it's difficult, she said, living. And then she changed it to working in two worlds. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. So is this a delusion? Is it a hallucination? Or is this a profound statement about... The fact that she changed it from mm. living to working suggested to me that this was a conscious statement. Was this a statement she made as part of a longer discussion or was it something that just no. came out? No, a lot of the things she said just came out mm. because most of the time she was repeating herself over and over again, mm. driving everybody and me crazy. And then she'd come out with something like that. And I thought, well, that's um, that. And then and then when she started to tell me other things, um, she said, you must tell others. And so I, I, so I was writing down the profound things that she was saying. Because that's um, interesting, isn't it? That, that, that suggests, you know, that either she was speaking through herself or another part of her was speaking through the Alzheimer's to you to say, you yeah. must tell others about this. Yeah. There was yeah. an urgency there. Yeah, there was. And as a psychotherapist, it was my practice after a session with a client to write up notes. Um, so in those, in those days, um, well, I did have a computer, but I, I wouldn't have done that on a computer. So after I visited her, I'd go home and go to my room and sit down and write up notes and, um, and the things that she'd said that I jotted down while I was with her. And I did check with her, I said, is it all right? Are you happy for me to uh, make, record this? And she said, yes, yes, you must tell others. So I knew that I, you know, as more and more was disclosed to me, I knew that I had a book there, but I didn't, it wasn't appropriate to start working on that while I was journeying with her. And even, you know, for three years after that, I was supporting my father and I didn't want to be working on material to do with my mother. And I was supporting my father, so I waited. And then yeah, because of course, for you, you know, it, it's understanding. And if there's anybody listening in from the states and, and other countries, it's a long way from London <laughs> to the west coast of Scotland, isn't it? You know, it's not an easy journey, and you must have been doing that over a period of a long time. And it must ten be years, ten years, ten years. Really? <laughs> Oof, because that. Because when my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's through through me, mm -hmm. um, demanding that they did something because she was manifesting what what you know I was analysing as being uh, Charles Bonnet syndrome, which we can touch on later, and but I was in the position we were living in Harrogate at the time, but I realised that there were things and issues with my mother, so we moved over to Wirral to be close to her. So I was fortunate enough that I was round the corner, but I wasn't dealing with the issues you were dealing with in two ways. I wasn't dealing with my father who died a few years before, who was also your father was deteriorating, but also the vast distance you had to travel. So the stress on you must have been, and plus the complexities, and your sister was still alive at this time, I guess. No, she had died. Okay, yeah. but you still had, all, so you were on your own dealing with this. Yeah. And that must have played a lot on your psychology i think um, no. friends used to say oh maggie you know you need to have some retail therapy but i was finding this so wonderful mm. i couldn't wait to get back my biggest worry was because i was running training courses that ran for six months and people had booked way in advance and hotels and flights and everything my biggest worry was that there'd be a crisis when i uh, on a weekend when i was running a course that 
the universe looked after me and it never happened. Wow, that's interesting in itself, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So when your mother used the term, I'm working within two worlds, or between said, two I'm worlds. I'm working between two Between worlds. two worlds. Yeah. Mm. Let's talk about the, the, the other world at the moment, but in terms of this world, what was your interpretation of that? And what do you think was going on there? Right. Well, first I want to say that, um, well, I've already said that my mother went through the horrendous period that other people usually go through of, of being in denial about of the things that they're not managing and so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> but when I when the, the book really starts when she has what I'd call late stage Alzheimer's. And at, in the late stage, people have really given up the fight. They're much they've moved into a state of surrender because while you're in that fighting horrendous stage you know there isn't much scope for <laughs> spiritual enlightenment but um yeah uh, it, she what was the question again i'm trying to remember how question was in, in terms of when she said she was uh, she was working between two worlds yes, yes. and we'll touch upon the other worlds at the moment but yes the things about what she was doing in this world yeah well I noticed lots of things were changing for example um when we speak we have a thought it goes through a filter and then we speak with Alzheimer's that filter seems to disappear people have a thought and they speak so that was one observation I made. Um, I noticed that when she couldn't find the words she wanted to use, she would often speak in, in metaphorical language. And I found this really intriguing, you know, it's what does she mean? Just, Did she, would she ordinarily have done that when she, oh, she was well, not oh, right? No, okay. No, it was quite an intelligent um, strategy of hers. Mm. So the, she'd, uh, she said one, one day, Margaret, Margaret, she always called me Margaret, Margaret left with something in her ear last night. And I said, well, you know, what was that? <laughs> and she said the things I told her. And, uh, and, um, and on another occasion when she was, we were sitting in the, um, the lounge in the care home and we were the last to leave. And I said, oh, when do people, you know, go to their rooms? And the reply to that would have been, um, I can't think of myself for a moment, but she used the word elastic, meaning flexible. Right. So she was, uh, and uh, lots of people with Alzheimer's uh, say that. But I think there's uh, something that um, struck me about the difficult behavior that some people have. I'm, I'm digressing from my mother now, but it just was something that, um, well, she, she, she had um, really quite bad memories of things. And she said things like, I'm a bad person. Was I a good mother? You know, and these were difficult questions <laughs> because there were times when she had not been a good mother mm. and I didn't want to distress her then. But Carl Jung, I'm going to read this. Um, Carl Jung said, um, forgotten or repressed material surfaces in a state of diminished consciousness. And I think a lot of people who are expressing, you know, bizarre or difficult behavior, it's probably repressed emotional memories that are surfacing. And I think that's quite useful for pe people to keep in mind. Mm. That's something that, um, another thing that came, I became aware of to do with thought and memory, um, she said, I know my thoughts are clear. I'm confused when I can't remember. And this is a theme that ran through the th three years until she died, that she continued having thoughts. And if you think about it, um, it might just be the speech part, the part of the brain that translates the thoughts into language and speech may be not functioning. Mm. And that doesn't necessarily mean that people aren't thinking. Yeah. And that's huge. And quite sad as well, isn't it? It you know? is. But we managed to keep, because I was aware of that, mm. I just kept the conversation 
going. And I kept checking, you know, she was thinking, she kept saying yes, emphatically. Um, and I, I, I attended a, a talk by Professor Oliver Turnbull from Bangor University, who did some research into Alzheimer's and he found that emotional, um, emotional memory, uh, long-term emotional memory stays. It's a short-term emotional memory that goes. And it's not that it necessarily goes, it just gets often, they think it gets filed in the wrong place. So it's just not retrieved, but it's there somewhere. Um, what else? He also said that people continue to learn emotionally, even when their cognitive ability is failing. And it seems to me that as cogn cognitive ability decreases, emotional awareness and other um, awareness increases. Mm. And that takes me on to some other research by, um, what was her name? Uh, dear, I've got it somewhere. Yes, Virginia Strum at the University of California, San Francisco Memory and Aging Center. She did some very interesting research into people with Alzheimer's. And she found that as, yes, as cognitive function declines, empathy increases. And my mother said something that um, demonstrated that. Uh, she said, you look pensive tonight. I can tell everything, everything through the eyes, every expression. And um, the, the same um, researcher said that uh, there's such a thing as emotional contagion. So if, if I was angry with my mother, she would feel that anger. But I, if I was feeling compassion and loving, she would feel it too. And um, this, in, when this research first came out, there's quite a lot of uh, discussion around this because that has huge implications. Mm. If you think about the behavior of the people who are caring for people and supporting people with Alzheimer's. If, if they ha have a positive attitude and a loving attitude, the person they're caring for will sense that. They become ultra sensitive to voice tone, to facial expressions, to gestures. So even though they may not be able to organize their words that clearly, they are still really tuned in. Because that's interesting, isn't it? It's almost like their um, the consciousness is changing and it is, it's becoming more out, outward and yeah. moving into the kind of the, the outside collective unconscious and picking up the nuances. Because most of the time we don't do this. And it's something that I was noticing with my mother as she was deteriorating into it. She, she started doing things as if she was almost bipolar. Mm -hmm. And there was a part of her that would do things repetitiously and i find now at my age that sometimes i'll find i will be doing things automatically mm -hmm. that i'm i think why am i why have i just m moved to do that i mean a classic mm -hmm. is you know that i'll i'll go to put stuff in the dishwasher even though it's on and i'll just do it automatically and open the dishwasher mm -hmm. and i wonder whether what's happening is we're almost becoming by locating in terms of consciousness in some way and we really don't know we're doing these things because our consciousness level is rising up and suddenly we are not individuated, mm -hmm. but we're broadening out into a wider worldview. And I have a theory about this because if there's such a thing as emotional contagion, um, if, if you um, believe in the seven layers of energy that surround the body, I call it our human energy field. Mm. One of these layers is emotional. Now, our scientists have found that there's contagion, there's emotional contagion. Then I argue that there's contagion throughout the whole of the energy field, mm. right to the superconscious. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm sure that my mother was tuning in, you know, on that level when she was communicating with me. And I think um, this, this has really important, what I've just said about memory and um, emotions, 
has has really important implications for everyone. Because it, it um, if we remember that emotional memory remains, and there's an increase in empathy, an increase in emotional contagion an increase in subtle energy contagion, that's my theory. And I haven't talked about creative expression, but another thing that um, came to light was, and, and also through my reading about Alzheimer's, is that as, as people develop, as Alzheimer's develops, people become more creative. They lose their inhibitions. And if I'm translating that into brain function, I would, uh, I would say that the right hemisphere, which controls, which controls small chunks of information sequentially, so it's our logical thinking, um, doesn't work so well. But the right hemisphere, which ha has the gestalt view, becomes more active. I, that's my personal view, and I haven't deviated from that since mm. I first came across that thought. It seems seems really evident to me yeah i think it does it? it's a more holistic worldview mm -hmm. and a more open worldview i mean the point that was quite interesting when we were discussing earlier on about ospensky and it's a lot of the ospensky ideas and they have the gurdjieffian ideas as well about consciousness uh, are very much applied here and i'd never really drawn those links and i think your comment about people with alzheimer's are just more sensitive to everything really does make you realize that in terms of homes and everything that the way people do things and deal with people with alzheimer's we may be getting it wrong we may there may be another approach that is far more effective and i think that maybe your book will be the book that will will hopefully you know more and more people will read and hopefully from from this discussion maybe more people will discover it we'll start to approach it in a different way because it's a circumstance that we're all going to end up in aren't we at some stage in the future we're going to be there where your mother was and where my mother was well i don't, I don't know um, at the moment over half of the population in the uk have either a relative or know a friend who's got dementia that's a that's a lot of people it is isn't but it? i don't know if you heard uh, radio 4 this morning yeah, I did about the new drug. <laughs> yes, and and the, the news there's a there's a new drug that they're going to there's there's research into a new drug for Alzheimer's that would help to dissolve the plaques in the brain that that cause Alzheimer's. I'm looking forward to my copy of the New Scientist, which will come on Friday to read about that. Mm, absolutely, I haven't, I haven't uh, had time today to to follow that up. But um, I'm sure it will be a cure for Alzheimer's. But what I'm what I'm talking about isn't just about Alzheimer's. You know, Alzheimer's is a protracted end of life experience. So it gives us time to explore. Yes. Can you explain that more? When you mentioned this to me a few days ago, I thought that was an incredibly intriguing and very powerful observation. Right. Can you just expand on yes, that? Because yes. it's important you do that, I think. Right. Well, I've noticed with friends who've been dying of cancer that they have gone through very similar um, stages as my mother, but in a very short period of time. Whereas uh, my mother, uh, you know, she, she her Alzheimer's dying period was three and a half years. And it was gradual. And, and I was able to record and observe and comment on the different stages. Um, but most people who are dying of a, a, an illness don't have that time. So I think that this, what I've written about here, about Alzheimer's has implications for way beyond Alzheimer's. But what's important is that the Alzheimer's part is important because my mother said things when she had advanced Alzheimer's. So she wasn't, it wasn't that she just read something or she just heard it and remembered it because her brain wasn't able to do that. And I think that um, for me, that, uh, that was a, a sort of profound verification that what she was telling me was 
pure wisdom. Mm. It was pure wisdom. As if she's attuning into, to, was, to coin a phrase, the poor, pure Akashic, almost. Yes, yes. She, well, she was. I, I can, she, she talked about the, the books. So I'll, I'll come on to that when you mm. go into the other world. But she, she was, I'm, without doubt, in my mind, she was tuned into the Akashic records. Uh, and, the, and, and my late sister uh, was also tuned in and passing the information on to my mother. Which makes it even more intriguing, doesn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. How, how was she in terms of, before we move on to the really yes. interesting stuff, because let's just expand a little bit here. How was she with, with the other people in, 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 the, in the home? Was she, was she okay with them? Did she communicate in similar ways? No. Or was it only you she communicated with? Only me. She right. was kind, you know, she was loving and very complimentary. And the way she kept telling me what nice teeth I had. Mm. Every time she saw me, she told me what nice teeth I had. <laughs> um, so she was complimentary, but it was interesting. It was as if she and I were in a sacred space together. Because even when my niece was visiting with me or my son was visiting with me, we somehow didn't, we didn't find that sacred space together. And she noticed it. That's interesting. So you kind of created this kind of holistic egregore between the two of you. Yes. And it worked when there was just the two of you. Yes. Yeah. I think it would have worked if there'd been other people who were tuned in at our level. Mm. But mm. Um, there wasn't anybody else <laughs> tuned in at that level. I had friends in London, you know, and I wanted people to know how my lovely mummy had become so wise and you know after all her troubles and of course people nobody in London knew her mm. and the people up here went to the Church of Scotland on a Sunday but they weren't really interested in the sort of things that I was discussing and discovering. Because this hits the nail on the head doesn't it it's one of the things that we've discussed many times on this on this broadcast is that there are, that we are, we're all being drawn together because we have similar interests in matters esoteric, which puts us slightly as outsiders to the, to the general population. Mm -hmm. And we're all being drawn together because there's synergy taking place here mm -hmm. um, and understanding. And I think you're quite right that if there had been people, the kind of people we know that we mix with, mm -hmm. It probably she would have thrived in that because the egregory would have got greater and could have brought her out. But I think in many ways, presumably the relationship between a mother and a daughter, particularly what you'd been through before, because effectively you are an emanation of her in terms of her DNA, in terms of her life and everything else as well. So there's this great communication that you can only probably have with your own children or your own mother and father which other people won't necessarily pick up on. Mm -hmm. But moving on now, so we've, we've discussed her working in this world. Mm -hmm. What did she mean by saying she was working in two worlds? What was the other world she was in? Well, there was a transition period, and she said things like, I need to get my energies in the right position. I'm getting everything ready in a position for starting so she so she was preparing herself for this what? almost change like from a, um i don't know a chrysalis to a mm -hmm. butterfly mm -hmm. almost because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. i remember one of the things that really resonated when i read the book was the way she was saying they are they are trying to get the parts of my brain together and attuned mm -hmm. and i remember thinking then that that is intriguing yeah, yeah, right at the beginning. This is right at the beginning. I missed that bit out, but sorry. Um, she said, um, they helped me. And I said, who's there? And she said, two women. And I said, you know, how are they helping you? My brain, they've taken things out. I'm feeling much better. Uh, this, to me, was like psychic surgery. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, because I've come across that before, I didn't dismiss it out of hand. 
I did check with the staff in case there had been two women visitors who'd you know, been to see her, but there hadn't been. She hadn't had any other visitors, not physical, in physical form. Mm. And this happened, she had, she called them operations, and she had, she remembered she'd had three or four operations on her brain from non-physical entities who had helped her and each time she said she felt better. In fact, if I can find my notes on this so that sort of further on, on our journey, um, she said she, she'd never felt so well. Really? Mm -hmm. Because this, again, we must put this into context. This is a lady who's been brought up in the Presbyterian tradition mm -hmm. of Western Scotland. It's not a world that she would be even thinking about, is it? It's, it's not that kind of relationship with God that, that would be within the Presbyterian Calvinistic tradition. No. You know, so she, it's not as if she's attuning into memories that she's had or belief systems she's had. This is antithetical to her, would have been antithetical to her belief systems. Yeah. So that in itself is so powerful, mm -hmm. isn't it? And these entities seem to be just coming through. They, it was as if they, the doors of perception were opening for her and the entities were able to come through yeah. and manipulate she, in some way. She said, um, what was it? She said, it's amazing the thought process. I have everything organized. It's nearly complete. I think a lot. I have lots of thoughts. Um, and I asked her, you know, how and she's a, a sort of, a, she's, a, as she said about her brain, my brain doesn't work. So she knew her brain didn't work, but she still had lots of thoughts. And um, yeah, just, the, I, it's amazing the thought process. I feel well. I haven't felt like this for a long time. And this is in late stage Alzheimer's. Wow, so the, something was happening. Yeah. And she couldn't remember from one moment to the next. So it wasn't something that she'd seen or heard or read. Mm. And that, was, that's important as well, isn't it? We're dealing with yeah. somebody here who's in, by that stage, late stage Alzheimer's, whereby there are moments of lucidity. And it's yes. when the moments of lucidity came through that these pearls of wisdom yeah. suddenly came out. Now, if we argue that in those states you know even time itself starts to become different you mm -hmm. know there are there are bits of lucidity here and i recall um one very very peculiar event that took place with my own mother which i'll just put in now because i think it's probably the right moment to do it about the way in which time seems to work for people with alzheimer's and i received a phone call one day from the home and i could hear in the background my mother in a state of you know, she was shouting and everything else as well and very, very irritated. And they said, can you speak to your mother? Because we need to calm her down. Something's triggered something and she's yeah. she's really difficult to deal with. So I, I went to the, I picked it. I gave they gave her the phone and I said, hi, mum. And she said, oh, Tony, it's you. And I said and I, and I thought, God, that's most words I've had out of her, even recognition, yeah. because, you know, last time she didn't recognize me. She goes, Tony, these people have kidnapped me. She said, when your father finds out about this, we are going to sue them. And I said, Mum, well, what do you think is happening? She said, I don't know. It's very peculiar. She said, you, me and your father were sitting watching Morecambe and Wise. And I just I just went for 40 winks. And I wake up and I'm here and I don't know what's happened. I don't know how they kidnapped me. I don't know where my where your father is or anything. And then she's accusing them. She said, I'm going to sue you, you and you. Mm -hmm. And then I said, mum, 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 you're, you're, you're 90 years of age. And she said, no, I'm not. Yes. And I said, look at your hands. And she said, why do I need to look at my hands? And I said, because they'd be an old lady's hands. And she said, no, I'm not looking at my hands. No, 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 no. And then she went and it was incredible. She then went, you said you were my son. And I said, yes. And she said, you sound too old. You're much older than my son. My son is away at university. And I turned around to her and said, Mum, what year do you think it is? And she said, of course I know what year it is. It's 1974. Mm -hmm. And the shiver went down my spine and I went, oh, my God. And then I realised, and then she, she got really, and she slammed the phone down on me. 
And then we, we, when I talked to her again, she, she, she'd lost it again. But that made me realize, just imagine from her point of view, if it was true mm -hmm. that she was sitting watching Morecambe Wise in 1974, she suddenly closes her eyes for a second, she wakes up as an elderly lady. And there's this sudden, the time has disappeared between those times. How terrifying that must be. Now, mm -hmm. a previous guest on this show is a friend of mine called uh, Ed Gilchrist. And Ed's son experiences schizophrenia and temporal lobe epilepsy. And we've discussed this, that he argues that his son exists in a totally different non-linear time to us. He flicks backwards and forwards in time mm -hmm. in many ways. Mm -hmm. And isn't that rather, isn't it rather uplifting, but also terrifying mm -hmm. to think that's probably that's what your mother was doing. She was dipping in and out, almost in a dream sequence, almost in the Bardo state mm -hmm. where she was seeing yeah. things and realizing. At one point she said, um, which, which century? I don't know which century. And I thought this sounds like past life stuff to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's as if, you know, they, and if they're attuning into the Akashic field or the, the Laszlo Akashic, the Akashic record or whatever, the bits of information are being picked up from all over the place and be pulled together in some way. Yeah. Now, there were a series of, I think you mentioned a number of very curious, powerful evidence that your mother was attuning into you and your life and was attuning into other lives as well. Every time you tell me this, I find these <laughs> extraordinary. Like Maggie's mini. Can you just tell this story? Because yeah. guys, <laughs> if you have not heard this, this will blow your socks off. This is <laughs> incredible. <laughs> well, um, I was in London uh, preparing for a trip to Scotland and a friend was with me and I, I wanted to show him where I was going. So I went on Google what is it? Google. Google Earth. Uh, and I uh, found the, the house where my father was still living and where I stayed when I went up there and the care home next door. And I zoomed down into the garden. And there was my mother had always had minis. It was that was the that was her favorite car. From when they came out, she'd always had a mini. And there was her blue mini sitting in the driveway. And I just thought, well, that's an old photograph. Anyway, the next day I go up to, it was Trun actually, you know, in Scotland. And um, I approach mummy and she says, my blue mini. <laughs> my blue mini. And so, she must, I, I don't know, but maybe I was carrying that in my field and she tuned into it because it was something that was important to her, but it was spontaneous. It was the first thing she said to me. And there's no explanation for that, is there? Absolutely. There is no possible no, explanation no, for that. No. Other than coincidence. You know, law of group, but large numbers, you know, come on, this is a specific car. It's a specific color. And it was something you were talking about the day before. Yes. Now, either it means she's attuning in to you and seeing the world through you and the things yes. that you're thinking about. Or. Whatever. But doesn't this suggest, though, that people in this state are out there in the they're almost in out of body experiences, they're remote viewing. Because that wasn't the only time that happened, was it? No, I counted up eight uh, examples of ESP extra. Can you take can you take us through them? Yes, I'll try and remember what one of them was really beautiful. I call it the Lost Roses. Um, I hadn't been able to get to, to I hadn't been able to visit my mother on Mother's Day. So I made a card that had uh, 12 roses on it and, and sent it to her for Mother's Day. And when I arrived in her room a couple of weeks later, I was looking for the card because the staff always kept the cards up and they didn't hide them away. And I was and I, looking everywhere and, and I couldn't see it. And then my mother said, the lost roses. Mm. Whoa. 
<laughs> so not only did she know that there was a you know there was something with roses but she knew that they were lost and to me that was it was on so many different levels it let me know that she knew that i thought about her that nothing was lost because she knew and it's uh, something about the importance of our intention and our clarity of thought to um that when people are, are, are tuning in they'll 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 tune into they'll tune into what's there i know which is which is really problematical if there's things you're thinking that you don't want them to know about <laughs> exactly. isn't it <laughs> well there was another occasion when you know because i was the only family member left i was having to deal with um, i had power of attorney and I had a meeting, I was in London again, and I had a meeting the following day or in a day or two with our family solicitor. And I had to make some, some really big decisions that I, I felt very uncomfortable about it, you know, to do with money and, and what my, the probability. It was, a, it, was, it was to do with finance and probability. And that's not something I normally deal with, but I had, I had to. And I had an appointment and um, I walked into the care home a couple of days later and before I even got to my mother she said Margaret's involved with funds and finance and I thought Can you know? <laughs> she said Maggie's Margaret's a little confused God. <laughs> and I thought she's, she's right She's right, but she didn't hold it again. You know, it wasn't. She didn't hold it against me. She didn't. Mm. I didn't feel I was being told off. I was just being told the facts. Mm. And on another occasion, um, sort of less important thing, but the th there was a gas fire in the living room in the house next door, and it wasn't working. And I managed to fix it. And she said, "Margaret's fixed the gas." And there was another occasion when I came up. It was actually when my father had been admitted to the home because he'd had a fall and fractured his elbow and blah, blah, blah. Um, and I had to come up to have a meeting to discuss, you know, where, where, whether he would become, whether it was going to be a permanent arrangement and so on. And, uh, and, and my mother said, I wasn't invited to the meeting. And I thought, well, actually, it wasn't about you, but she clearly thought that she should be there and had a had a say in it. Because again, this just shows if there had just been one case, yeah, we would understand it. But they, there are a number. I mean, there was was there a time where you were having work done on your teeth or something, or she said oh, you yes, were having problems yes. with your teeth? She said, um, Margaret's got problems with her teeth. And she was right. I'd just been to the dentist. I did have problems with my teeth. And another occasion, I was actually moving house in London, but I didn't involve my parents in that. They had enough to deal with. But it was huge, you know, moving house. And, um, and she, she said, Margaret's, um, Margaret's not at home or something like that. Margaret needs to look after herself or something like that. And Margaret's... And I was exhausted. You know, I was moving house. I was continuing to support myself financially by working. I was commuting to Scotland. I had my father who was lurching from one crisis to another. I was exhausted. And, um, and she tuned into the fact that I was moving house. It's interesting, isn't it, that she always uses the term Margaret mm -hmm. as if she's not necessarily talking to you? Oh, I want to talk to you about that. Okay. Because I had a conversation with her about that um, quite a few times because she'd talk about Margaret and then I'd say, um, but I'm Margaret. And she'd say, I know. And then I said, well, are there two of us? And she said, yes. And I said, you know, are we the same? And she said, no. Uh, you're meant to be different. <laughs> Damon and Adolon. 
And then she said, this is interesting. She said, Margaret has a copy. That's good. And I was going to ask you about this because this is very much your, mm. your area of investigation. Well, well funnily enough. What do you think of that? Well, that is fascinating in the sense that she clearly is picking up on our own mental duality, but also that there's a version of you that's good, which implies there's a version of you that's bad. I don't um, say that. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, you know, if we, we, we look at our own personalities, you know, we, we do have these negative and positive sides. And in fact, one of the, the, the themes I'm developing in my new book, or maybe a subsequent book, will be the idea of the kalodemon and the kakodemon. And, you know, the kalos is Greek for good and kakos is Greek for bad. And the idea that we, we all have these kind of elements within ourselves that can be both agents for good and agents for bad, because, you know, I argue the daemon is ambivalent. The daemon doesn't is not necessarily an agent for good anyway. If you're I mean, Hitler had a daemon who clearly wasn't because Hitler's daemon saved his life by kicking the bomb and be, behind the, the desk during the Staffenberg plot. So clearly. There is something here that people, when they're more attuned, pick up these nuances about us and about who we really well, are. My understanding of what she said was that it was good to have a copy, which mm -hmm. suggested that there wasn't always a copy. Interesting. Yes. And yes. she also said some other interesting things. She had contact with deceased relatives and she said, I have relatives visit me. They help me. I have a telephone directory. I can talk to anyone I want. I spoke to Fiona, that was my sister. She's fine. Dad, he's just there. Mom, she's a hoot. My brother, her deceased brother, asked me to visit him. And she, she did. But she also said, I have Margaret and Fiona in the same breath. When she was talking about deceased relatives, she says, I have Margaret and Fiona which made me think that there were at least versions of us together. Yeah, and sort of the many worlds interpretation, yes. you know, the idea that there are multiple copies of us in multiverses, yes. all of which are living subtly different lives. And again, this is something literally I'm writing up at the moment oh, for, for an article, you know, which, which again, you know, does suggest that suddenly, you know, we're getting into the, the Everett's multiverses, we're getting into areas of possible quantum physics here mm -hmm. whereby she's attuning in in a greater depth and again we need to stress from her cultural background mm -hmm. the idea of talking to the dead mm -hmm. and communicating with the dead was was you know sort of not the worldview at mm -hmm. all yeah. can you tell us a little bit more then about the communications that she claimed to be having with your sister um well, she, she, she said one day, which took me completely by surprise, because she'd been telling me about, you know, the women who'd helped her, and, and there'd been lots of examples of her um, telling me things about the other world, which I, I haven't actually spoken about yet, but... Um, which we need to. Yes, we need to. Uh, so I was very impressed with all these things that she told me. And then she said, um, it's all coming from Fiona. And I thought, what? You know, this is my sister who'd been the black sheep of the family, you know, been an alcoholic for, <clears throat> for 30 years, um, who'd caused terrible problems. You can imagine this, you know, nice middle-class family in a, you know, very conservative town and this daughter who behaved uh, behavior was just terrible and, I mean, and everybody tried to help but nobody nobody could and um so when she said it's coming from shona and she talked uh, um not shona fiona she talked about fiona uh is reading from the book and i i, th I thought that was the akashic records i i I think that she was getting information from, I call it the universal energy field, or whatever name you want to, to give it. But um, just trying to think, she said other things like, I have a first, I have access to a first aid box. I can go to it at any time and get what I need. 
an injection in my brain. Ooh. Well, actually, if you read uh, Jane Roberts, the Seth material, mm. she talks about that. Interesting. Yeah. She also, uh, my mother had uh, life reviews. She had quite a few life reviews. Um, I'm remembering now, all my life. Now, literally, I'm really interested in this because literally only, again, it's the how synergy and how these coincidences, mm -hmm. synchronicities work. But literally, um, I've written up the section for an article on the panoramic life review, literally just before I became live on here. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell me more about her panoramic life reviews? Then? Yes. Well, she said, I'm remembering all my life. I'm remembering all the difficult times, all the people. Was my life worthwhile? Mm. And I wanted to reassure her because she'd done a lot of really good things. You know, when, when she was ill, life was difficult, but she went back to teaching and she became a specialist dance teacher in schools and creative movement. And uh, she also became, um, she kind of looked after the senior girls in the school. She, she contributed a lot to people's lives. A veritable Isadora Duncan in her own world. Yes, yeah. So, and I, so I just went through all the things I could think from making dresses to baking cakes to the children that she'd helped and supported and all, all the good things. However, it wasn't enough because, you know, at the time it seemed to ease things over, but I think she had three life reviews with me. Mm -hmm. um, and each time it was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bad person. I'm remembering all the bad things. And each time I was trying to um, console her, I didn't want her to die mm -hmm. carrying that burden. My, my aim was to um, enable her to, to clear everything that was negative before she passed on. Clear the enagrams. Yes. What, yes. How was she, when she delivered that, I've been a yes. bad person, was it done tearfully? Was it done sadly? Or was it just done matter-of-factly? No, the, her tone of voice was with regret. Mm. And then... Um, the last time I, I'm trying to remember how I did it, but what happened was really dramatic. And um, she, she suddenly said, "I love everyone." In she had two voices. I should have said this before. All right. She had her repetitive, "Your teeth are so white." <laughs> <laughs> she had her repetitive voice and then sometimes she had a voice of absolute authority when she was my teacher and I was her devotee and she said I love everyone and I responded with a, what an NLP would be called a command I said it's complete and that just bang, you know, it did it. She, um, it, com it did complete that. So love kept coming, the theme of love kept coming, coming in. And, uh, you know, I say time and time again, that love is the first gateway. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because again, I, I keep thinking here in terms of my own hypothesis of the Damon and Adelon diet, that what seems to be happening is demonic consciousness for want of a better term the more the higher self is coming through and you know the two voices again you know the idea that there's a an, an authoritative all-knowing entity coming through in some way together with the everyday entity that's within the game within the simulation that's that's sort of fading away slightly yeah. but the new one is coming in and the new one is helping the edelon to pass over in some way and is working with it in some way, but they're both her, they're mm -hmm. both aspects mm -hmm. of her. Mm -hmm. And the daemon is coming through more and more powerfully as time goes on. And it's beco becoming, and that is really intriguing. That is fascinating in itself. 
um, she had life reviews for learning from the past and she had programs for learning for the future. Right. Tell and us she more. She talked about the first program and then she didn't like the first program or there was a program. I think it was the second program. She said she didn't like it, but I think she knew that she didn't have a choice. If she didn't follow that program, that would be it. And then the third program, she liked, she had a choice and she liked it. Yeah. So um, she said, I need to decide which program. Television is amazing. So I think her television was her third eye. She used to sit and rub her third eye like that. You know, so did my mother. Did she, she, did, really? she did exactly the same gesture. Oh, she she was rubbing here yes. to the point it almost became raw. Yes. And I've just realised this now. Wow. That is weird. So that's two women, both with Alzheimer's, both doing the same gesture. Yeah. I might try it myself. <laughs> yeah, that, that is interesting to be trying to touch it almost you know and, and trying the pineal gland trying to stimulate yes. the pineal gland to yeah. maybe generate more dimethyltryptamine as as they're getting towards this yes. you know i'd never picked up on that right Whoa. well it seemed it, it didn't seem terribly sig significant except that you know just along with other things i noted all these things um she also was channeling. She said, I've got to wait until some messages come through. And that, that was followed with everything. Everything's coming from Fiona. That was my deceased sister. One of the things we discussed last week when we had a general chat was, and I, th I think I'll mention it here and we're, we're, you know, very quickly in the terms of Peking Darian experiences. And peak and Darian experiences are something that have been discussed by the Society for Psychical Research since about the 1890s, when the phrase was first coined. And the peak and Darian experience comes from the poem by John Keats. And I think it's on first seeing the, the, the Pacific, where Cortez, I think it was, it, was it Cortez or was it, um, it was one of the, the Spanish conquistadors. And he arrived down in the Central America. Um, um, in Central America, around Salvador or somewhere, or Guatemala. And he was the first Westerner or European to see the Pacific Ocean. And he saw it from a peak in Darien. So he was seeing a new world and a new way of seeing reality. And the, the psychic researchers very much use that for end of life circumstances, whereby a person suddenly, their brain starts to attune, their doors of perception start to open, and they start to have Peking Darian experiences where suddenly the other world starts to come through, mm -hmm. where the other world becomes part of their visual field, becomes part of their seeing and hearing and everything else as well. Mm -hmm. And is this what again was happening with your mother that because as you so wisely have said, this is a kind of a long dying experience that it can be done sequentially and can be planned, whereas ordinarily it's truncated into a very small area. So what did you find out about your mum's other world? Did you get any information for oh, us yes, in terms lots. of that? <laughs> lots, and um, she, um, she said things like, death is nothing to be afraid of. Um, peace and quiet. And if I can just find her exact words, because, uh, yeah. Sorry about this. Um, where are they? Um, I can't find them, but she did want, she reassured me that death was nothing to be afraid of, that, you know, it's, she'd had a preview. She, she said a preview. She told me she had a preview. <laughs> that was nothing to be afraid of. And, um, and it, peace and quiet. The climax, she said, the climax. Wonderful, or something like, like that. Well, it's interesting here that one of the people in the chat room, Laura Brown, 
has, has posted to say, a gentleman I supported for two years with advanced Alzheimer's became incredibly sensitive and psychic. He spoke about going to being in another world. He said it was like looking in the mirror, but not quite the same. He said that there's another one of us. It's interesting. There is another one of us all in the other worlds, almost like a parallel. His words have always stayed with me. I learned so much from him and also found the time I spent with him very therapeutic. Yeah, that, all that makes sense. And this is when we get very frustrated with the materialist reductionist worldview that many people have. They're not listening, no. are they? No. They are not listening to the point I make many, many times. The things we are discussing here now are empirical proof. Yeah. The word empirical is from the Greek, and it means experience, from mm -hmm. experience. And my mother kept saying, you must, it, these, these moments are precious. You must experience them and remember them. And she emphasized experience. Yeah, it is. And to listen and not listen with your own no. ideas or your own restrictions or your own worldview, to just listen openly. I mean, Don Wyatt has pounded here to say, one of the guys I supported was severely autistic with acquired brain injury, profoundly deaf, had severe learning difficulties and potentially had temporal lobe epilepsy. And he displays such psychic abilities that I would often wonder if he could actually hear me sometimes. So again, we have this yeah. opening up, don't we? You know, this is... And the clarity of perception, she said, Margaret is home. And I am home. You are there and between and joining. Our energies are connected. These were her words. And I couldn't have described what was happening better than she did. These words say exactly what was happening. Yeah. It's, it's so like you had your, your, your own mother had become a guru. Yes. Or a teacher. Well, here we are. I found, I found the... Um, about leaving, preparing to leave, a preview, peace and quiet, my dream. It's the climax, it's the end, it's peaceful. Wow. Mm -hmm. So when she wa I was with her, fortunately I was there when she was passing on. And I, d I was able to, you know, I remember these words came to me, so I wasn't distressed. Mm -hmm. I was just present with her. And was she was she conscious or was she in a coma by that time? She was she was unconscious, but I'm sure she could hear me mm. because often the the hearing sense still I know the hearing sense still remains because when my sister was dying, she was in hospital on life support, and um, I was I was actually in Denmark at the time and. Um, giving a lecture and I had to fly back and an emergency for my sister who was on life support and my parents were too distressed to, to come in and see all this so I was with my sister and and um she she looked so peaceful on this ventilator compared with the dramas that had you know, I'd witnessed for 20 30 years and I, I said, I said to her, you look beautiful, you look peaceful, and you're going home. And the corners of her mouth went up. Wow. I'm not exaggerating. That happened. And I knew that she'd heard me. And then they switched off the machines. Do you know, one of the most dismissive phrases I, I come across in my research is the plural of anecdote is not proof. And it irritates the hell out of me because we witness these things happen in our lives and they are profoundly common. And the, the amount of responses we're getting here in, in the chat room is extraordinary in terms of people citing their own experiences that are supporting totally your position and worldview. And this... <laughs> And this is why your book is so important. And this is why, in terms of what your book has to say, is of, of profound significance. So she what... Said, 
she had um, an insight into the stages of dying. Go on. She said, um, I've entered the first stage. This is after she'd had the programs for new learning and the life, I think she had three programs for new learning and three um, life reviews. And I, you know, I knew things were, couldn't go on much longer. And she said, um, I entered the first stage and I said, how many stages are there? And she said, seven. Well, there are seven um, layers to the energy field. And I wonder mm. if what happens is that the, the, the field, the people move through the fields, I don't know. Um, and I asked her how long it was going to take. And she said, you know, a couple of months. So I actually thought I had quite a lot of time. It was only six weeks, I think, from when she said that. Um, but she said something else. I, I'm sorry, I'm darting around here. No, please, please, please. This is fascinating. Um, right at the beginning, she said to me one day, I'll fill both cheeks as if my cheeks need something. <laughs> but I took that to mean, you know, when people in, I don't know in England, but in Scotland, talk, people talk about being well filled out, meaning well fed. <laughs> right and um i took to mean that she was she was going to nourish me mm. nourish me not uh nutrition not nutritionally but um, not through food but spiritually and at the very end she said it's all done your cheeks have filled out we had a difficult beginning, but we've had a good ending. Whoa. That is extraordinary, isn't it? Because she, how many, what was the time scale? Between three and a half the, years, three and a half years. Be, yeah, but what about the time scale between the, 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 the cheeks analogy, between the but first time she mentioned years. it? Three years. Right. Oh, really? So it was three and a half years from when she first mentioned that to when, mm -hmm. so the chances of somebody with Alzheimer's remember remembering that. that no, not a chance. Not a chance. Not a chance that most of us would not remember that after three and a half years. No. But here we have an absolute message to yeah. say, I see continuity. The, everything I've been saying to you from the start mm -hmm. has a purpose and has an end point. Yeah. She said, I'm happy. Margaret has found the secret. <laughs> really? Yes. <laughs> and um, she taught, she showed me the secret. Yeah. You know, by giving me all this information. Absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah. It is almost as if, you know, she had that her dame was determined this time round to get the information through because this is information that we need mm -hmm. in order to help our own passing in one way or another. And um, a psychic friend of mine in London, um, who I used to see occasionally, he was a friend and he was a psychic. He, when he tuned in, he said that my mother was making up for the what she hadn't been able to give me when mm. I was a child. Well, you can imagine, can't you, if that she has these past life reviews and she relives again, yes. either as an observer or as a, a, a person within her own body, and obviously was feeling remorse for the way she was. Mm -hmm. This was her opportunity to say, I'm sorry, and I'll get it right next time or the next yeah. time we meet or whatever, I will get it right. Um, you know, and if you take my hypothesis of the cheating, the ferryman, the idea that we, when we move on, we live our own lives again and we interface with all our loved ones again. Yeah. The opportunity then for her to get it right is there for her to get it right because at the end of this life she'd had the past life reviews to prepare her Edelon to go back and treat Maggie differently and everybody else differently yeah. because because I think this is one of the sad things if we only ever have one life we never get the chance to put things right the things we got wrong yes and I always find it very invigorating and wonderful to think if cheating the ferryman is correct 
Mm -hmm. Damon will make sure that you will do it right next time. And I think your mother's experience was a classic example of that. But that's me bringing in my model. What do you think was happening? What is your your Maggie's hypothesis as to what was taking place here? Well, this is I, I just find this makes a lot of sense. In this world, it's Alzheimer's is a process of dissolution. So, you know, my mother said, you know, the past and, and future move into the present. So people with advanced Alzheimer's, they, they, all they know is the present. And they also lose their individual personality. The ego is, is kind of wiped out. Mm. Um, so the structures that have supported the ego and the personality disintegrate leaving what I think is the true essence of the person. And um, if you look at, you know, what is transcendence? Being in the present, in the now, with no ego is a transcendental state. So and I, I would argue that the altered states actually enable transcendence and access to the other world. So they should be honored. They should be really listened to. And um, what I've just said about, you know, the Alzheimer's in this world and the disillusion um, and just being in the now, I don't think anybody would dispute that. No, absolutely. Um, but what they don't seem to realize is that it's actually an, uh, enabling something else. And it's that something else that this book's about. Mm. And if I hadn't been on my spiritual journey all these years, I wouldn't necessarily have known to explore that. Yeah, so in many ways, your own, your own life and the way your life has developed was an, in anticipation of the encounters with your mother and the subsequent book. And I'm thinking the wisdom of what you're saying about the, accre the, the, the accretions of life, which is the ego state, which is the eidolonic state that I would argue, that we live our lives and we become that being that has been created from the experiences of this life, the enneagrams of this life. But when we die, we go back to the raw original state, but with the knowledge of the previous life that we've had, which helps us develop and grow in some way. Mm -hmm. You know, and almost there is this kind of attunement with the, the non-duality, the idea that we are, we are spiritual beings having a physical life, like Teilhard de Chardin said. Mm -hmm. And the idea that this is, this is, we are here to learn. We are here to, to experience everything we possibly can in order to make whatever our real essence is, our daemon or whatever it is, grow and develop in so many ways now i know i know the answer to this question but i'm sure the guys out there won't be i'm really excited to know about your future plans what are the things you're now doing what things are you involved in that will be taking the great ideas of this book mm -hmm. for i would just like i made a list of things i think are important before i move on to that oh yeah no please please yeah in conclusion, I'd say Alzheimer's provides an opportunity for conscious time. And the state of consciousness of the companion will affect the state of consciousness of the person with Alzheimer's or the person who is dying. That meaningful communication can continue if you really listen and tune in. And Thought, I haven't gone into this because I kind of skipped over it, but thought is independent of the brain. And that taps into Rupert Sheldrake's theory about market resonance theory and extended mind. But love is the first gateway to the other world. It enables positive experiences and a good death. My mother's other world experiences were that neither learned nor remembered, but were common to other seers. This for me proves the existence of the other world. And finally, dying can be an intelligent process. Wow. 
So what would your advice be to, to what was the statistic you mentioned earlier? Was it when we were live or was it beforehand? I think it was when we were chatting before we went live of the number of people who will be affected by Alzheimer's in one way or another going forward. But well, what would... the, the people touched by Alzheimer's, yes. well, half of the population mm. are touched by Alzheimer's, either through a family member or by someone they know. Um, uh, yeah, I suppose, I think rather than waiting till we go to the other world, we can work on ourselves in this world to become the best version of ourselves that we can. And, um, and I think people who are dying can help us to do that. So it's, it's an opportunity. Mm. I, th I, th I would imagine there's an awful lot of people watching this live and an awful lot of people that will subsequently watch this on the YouTube channel will find this a profoundly rewarding discussion. And I think, as I keep saying, your book is so important. You know, it cannot be lost. It is, it is, it is a book that I, am, I find it extraordinary that you were not on chat shows, TV, radio stations and everything else as well, that that has not happened. And yet, you know, on, you know, you listen on the radio these days and you've got people talking about the most banal nonsense about their lives. And we are preoccupied with celebrities and everything else. Mm -hmm. And yet the contents of this book is profound and so important and so helpful you know this morning on on radio four when they were talking about you know alzheimer's and dying and the dying process i was kind of shouting mm. i want to tell you what i know this is this is only just one part of it uh, <laughs> um it, it it's the the bbc are very resistant to anything spiritual so it seems and they're missing out massively yeah um they really really are but you know there, there are more and more of us coming together and we we can create something here mm -hmm. of great significance and i think that you me and the, the other members of our little group because maggie is part of my extended not my extended group our group it's not my group mm -hmm. it's an extended group of searchers after truth is even the wrong word but realizing that there is a reason for your life you're, you're not just a link in a genetic chain you're not just a slave to your dna there is something more to you there is something you are a spark of something that is greater you know that you're a shard, a shard of, of the pleroma in gnostic terms and we are all part of that and i think we're starting to change there is a feeling in the air at the moment maybe it's post covid and the things that's happening with covid but it's making people think a great deal more about exactly what they are you know forget all this thing of what you have and what you own mm -hmm. you're not here to do that mm -hmm. you're here to learn and help other people in one way or another mm -hmm. so moving then and again now yes. to your future plans yes. what are your future plans oh well um I'm, i i do a lot of volunteering work here in in fintorn when i arrived um i was struck by how many silver-haired people there were and <laughs> i'm thinking we're all going to fall like flies at the same time and there's <laughs> no, nothing to you know there was nothing to hold this so I started researching, you know, how I might improve the situation and um, uh, applied for a grant to a, a funder for uh, funding a, a paid post for a, a dementia care coordinator. And I got the money. <laughs> well, <laughs> got yeah. and, um, and with somebody else, um, we raised some more money in the community so that we could extend the work beyond Alzheimer's, beyond dementia. And she's been in post for a year and a half now, and just seems indispensable. But the the um, the money that I raised is running out, so we're, we're busy fundraising to try and um, 
bring in more money to in, in order for her job to continue. So it's well, really... well, can you tell, tell us about Findhorn then? And and then we'll, what we'll do is we'll post up the link after in terms right. of that. But tell us about Findhorn and what you're doing there. Right. Um, well, the, the about four or five hundred people live here. It's, it's a very interesting place. <laughs> There's some really wonderful people here. <laughs> and there's some pretty strange stuff here as well. Uh, I sometimes say to my friends in London, I feel a bit of an alien here because I'm not very extreme. I don't think I'm very extreme. Um, uh, and a lot of people here hold extreme views about this, that, and the next thing. Um, but it's a can, what I like about it is it's a can do place. You know, if you have an idea, um, you can, you know, probably get the support and run with it, which is what I did with the, you know, Alzheimer's um, support work that I've, I've been doing. Um, so, uh, I mean, Flintorn's going, like everyone else, is going through a very hard time at the moment. 85% um, of its income came from international guests flying from all over the world, because that hasn't happened. And now with climate change, and we don't want people flying from all over the world. So it's a very uncertain how things are going to move forward, to be honest. Then we had a massive fire when a, a resident in the community, a disgruntled resident, blew up the community centre and set fire to it and the, the meditation sanctuary. So we've got massive things going on here, really massive things going on. But I still like living here. <laughs> As I remember when we when we met um, at uh, was it King no it was Paddington was it Pat yeah yes. uh, St Pancras wasn't it St Pancras yes yeah and you were you were you were on your way to moving up there and Findhorn has always it seems to have such a magical quality in many ways I just have this vision of almost a, this kind of idealized community almost like Esselen or places like that you know that a group of like minded people have got together and created from nothing this this incredible community but at the same time i keep having visions in my own mind of um the prisoner and port myrian <laughs> the idea of um this kind of very interesting place and i know myself and a few of my associates were very keen to come up and see you at some yeah, stage yeah. and as soon as the the shackles are off we will be up to see you um, Great. because we because be we feel as a draw there's a draw to that part of Scotland. And because I've recently had my DNA done yes. and discovered that I'm 37% Scottish, yeah. which was, was amazing. So, you know, that I'm one thing, <laughs> yeah, I'm absolutely 100% Celt. I don't have any Sassanac blood in me at yeah. all. Yeah. You know, it's, in, in, it's Welsh, Irish, Scottish and Isle of Man. You know, yeah. I, I couldn't be more Celtic. Um, so I've, I've got a draw now to the Celtic fringe so I will be definitely oh that up, would be lovely up there and, to see and that makes me um think of the other people that I'm involved with because the I'm involved in working on a play based an adaptation of the book which and the play is called Between Two Worlds and um you you interviewed uh, the director last week I think we did indeed yes and i think you had a conversation with the producer the director Bra um not Brian, that's his dad jake murray and the jake producer, murray um I've forgotten his name but, uh, the producer's name of it oh jason, um jason jason jason, J jason, jason sure. fighting jake right. uh, jason yes. fighting yes, yes. Yeah. which um, i'm hoping to have as a future guest in the future and yeah. um, i had a, a a conversation with the script writer because of the problems of theatres at the moment, the play is going to be rewritten as an audio play. Right. And the script writer is actually starting on that today. All oh, right. Just a few things about the uh, the text because it has been written as a, a play for stage, but of course we haven't been able to do that, and it may be some time before we can do that. Do you know? I think it would lend itself quite well because um, yesterday I um, watched. Um, Jake's play uh, Endgame, uh, the his his um, directorship of the um, Samuel Beckett play yes. Endgame, and it was extraordinarily good. 
And yeah. I think done in the right way. And I think Jake Murray is the ideal guy for this, possibly. Mm -hmm. You could make it into something extraordinary mm -hmm. because of the way in which the communication takes place between yeah. you and your mother. Yeah. It could be made into something very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and subsequently then from there into, again, back into the stage play, mm -hmm. because I was delighted to facilitate contact between you and the guys on this because, um, you know, sort of Jason Fighty is an incredibly talented guy, as yeah. is Jake. You know, these guys yeah. really do know what they're doing and can yeah. create something extraordinary. And this is exactly what the gift of Alzheimer's needs. Yeah. You know, it, it is an extraordinary book with an extraordinary message. So um, I hope that we'll have a, an audio um, version. Um, Jason's going to submit it to the BBC as well. So we'll see. But we, we hope to have an audio version in the autumn, in, in uh, September. I'm also writing, working on a little book called The Little Book of Alzheimer's Insights, mm -hmm. which would pull together, you know, I would have the things that my mother said and my interpretation of what might be going on on the other side of the uh, on the other page so I'm working on that that would be wonderful that would be absolutely excellent mm -hmm. right well I'm aware of um, our time now yeah. um, and everything I think I have to say I have thoroughly enjoyed this as I always do whenever we talk you know I, I always enjoy it we learn so much um and we create something incredibly special mm -hmm. so maggie thank you very much um and if everybody's wondering where sarah is today sarah was called into london um and she was going to try and join us if she could but i did say that if you can't make it don't worry about it uh, we haven't lost her we haven't ditched her she's still around and still a very active part but today and in many ways it gave uh, maggie and i the opportunity to really expand into some areas of personal interest as well but i'm sure that sarah could have brought in some new angles on this which would have been quite fascinating as well so everybody thanks for listening in um again this will be um available forever on my youtube page and my sorry my facebook wall but also the recording of it will be placed on my youtube channel as well which you can find by just searching anthony peak on youtube and it will be up on a permanent basis from then as well so again thanks very much for everybody listening in it's been very very active in the in the chat room as well which is really wonderful so thanks again and maggie thank you very much for being an absolutely fantastic guest thank you very much well thank you for us for inviting me i've really enjoyed it too it's been great good oh, by the thank way as a, as a final point have you have you a website or anything that people could contact you Yes, um, MaggieLaterelle.com. Excellent. Okay, then. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And we will see there you There is all... one for the, the Gift of Alzheimer's as well. Gift of Alzheimer's. There are lots of blog posts on the Gift of Alzheimer's that people could find, will find really helpful. Good. So. Okay, absolutely. And we will post also the link to help you in any way we can in terms of the, the uh, coordinator as well. Okay, thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thanks again for listening. Sure. And speak to all. So see you all soon. Okay, then. Bye. Bye. Bye.